Welcome to Friday. Um, it is our COVID-19 update for Eau Claire, and we are glad you're joining us to get updated information. Welcome to the end of May. It is hard to believe that it is May 29th today. Today we'll be having status updates like we usually do, the state data, the local data. Luke Fidi is again with us from Human Services. He's going to be sharing um, some reminders about staying healthy during these challenging times. Certainly COVID-19 has been difficult. Um, this disease has had impacts that are wide ranging, not just on those that have gotten sick and those that have died in their families, but all of us are impacted. Um, I appreciate the reminders that Luke brings us to find ways to stay healthy. I also want, as we start, to name that this is a disease that is impacting people of color, not just all of us, but specifically impacting people of color in dis disparate ways across our state and nation. People of color are dying, getting ill and dying at much higher rates than, um, than white individuals in our, in our world. Public health sees racism as a public health issue um, because of outcomes like this. Things like COVID-19 disparate rates are certainly part of that. We need to call this out and do things differently in our world. The death of George Floyd this week in our neighboring community of Minneapolis is a reminder of that. Racism is an issue in our community and in every community across the U.S. My thoughts are with the family of Mr. Floyd and the grieving community of the, in the Twin Cities. We can and must do better. Public health sees that as critically important. Our state status update. Negative tests are now at 233,588 for COVID-19. That's an increase in 12,869 negative tests from Thursday. Positive tests are at 17,707, an increase of 733 positives from yesterday. Hospitalizations now are at 2,499 of those individuals, those 17,000 have ever been hospitalized. And we are now at 568 deaths, an increase of 18 people that have died from COVID-19 that are Wisconsin residents since yesterday. It is the highest single day of testing um, results back in our state. It's also the highest day of um, increased number of positive cases. We're not surprised by increases. We knew the disease was going to continue to increase in Wisconsin. A lot of good work happened with Safer at Home, but this is a disease that anybody is susceptible to, and we expected more cases over time. We are also not surprised by the increased testing numbers. In fact, that is a very positive um, step forward for our state. It was one of the things that was a priority and continues to be a priority for us to contain disease. And so having more testing done is a critical strategy that we are starting to see happen. However, um, the, positive, the percent positive has been actually falling statewide and we're around 5%. So again, of all the testing that's done, the percent positive is right around 5%. A couple of um, updates about Eau Claire. So our testing numbers now, we are at 4,839 individuals, Eau Claire County residents who have been tested, an increase of 261 since Thursday. Um, this is the second highest day of testing for us um, since um, we've had the testing event that happened in the beginning of May. We're seeing increased testing happening in Eau Claire County as well, likely partly related to long-term care facility testing that we've talked about previously. We are at 4,557 negative tests, and we are now um, having 110 positive cases by testing for COVID-19. Right now, we are at an additional six probable cases of COVID-19 as well. We've talked frequently about data being used to make decisions about what's needed in our county to prevent widespread um, increases in uh, COVID-19 infection. 
More data is being put on our website this week to indicate measures that we are actively tracking. Those measures help us understand not only the presence of disease, but our capacity, healthcare and hospital capacity, to really respond in an effective way to keeping that disease number from not climbing too rapidly. Our goal again is to work to slow the spread of COVID-19. We know we're not going to stop it, but that rapid increase will be a challenge. Having good case investigation and contact tracing work and to not overrun our healthcare system with very, very ill patients is again what we are trying to accomplish. And our data that we are tracking now is really looking at all of those measures. We're watching those data points locally, but also looking at some of them regionally, as well as um, across the state, because again, we know people don't just stay within the boundaries of our county. Healthcare systems in the Twin Cities are something else that we are looking at, and we do see increases in um, the capacity use at Twin City hospitals right now. That data just came out recently, signaling that Twin City hospitals are starting to see more COVID-19 hospitalizations. We do know that if um, people on the western side of the state are not able to go to hospitals in the Twin City area, they may come here, so we have to pay attention to that as well. Over the last 14 days, um, our positivity rate has been right around 4%. Um, we continue to think about the curve that we are on though, and because we had a very slow start of disease because of Safer at Home, we are anticipating that we will be quickly adding cases to our numbers in this community. Um, in the last half of the month, compared to um, back in April, we are seeing more cases per day. One of the metrics that we're tracking and that you'll see on our website will be showing us the change between two 14-day periods of the percent of positives, uh, actually the, the percent change of the number of positives that we have between those two time frames. We really need to pay attention to how our numbers increase and what our percent positive is, and that is part of what we're looking at. We also will be tracking deaths when and if those occur in Eau Claire County. The additional disease metric that we're tracking is outbreaks, and you've um, heard about that and seen that on the state website, and we'll also have that information available on our local website. All new outbreaks add to the potential of disease spread and um, the workload to make sure that we are containing disease. We are also tracking capacity metrics as we look at how our um, community can respond. Um, those are both related to public health measures and healthcare measures. We've talked about these a couple of times, but again, you all want us to quickly identify those cases and have them stay home. You want us in public health to make sure that anybody that they've been in contact with also stays home. A number of our cases were previously contacts, and if they would have been out in the community, they also would have been spreading disease. Our case investigation work and our contact work have to happen quickly. So one of the things we're closely tracking is, are we getting overwhelmed and not able to do that? So we are looking at how much time it takes to get to that case and how much time does it take to get all of our contacts identified and quarantined. Both critical measures for you to count on to make sure that the disease is not spreading rapidly. And then those healthcare measures. Every week, healthcare systems um, across the state are reporting into a statewide system that um, identifies capacity and whether they are having more COVID-19 than what they can handle. Things like ventilators, things like PPE, those, those things are being evaluated by our healthcare systems and they're documenting that regularly. Right now, our healthcare systems are doing well with their capacity. When and if that changes, we need to know that and we need to respond as a community to make sure it doesn't get worse. It's important to know that um, our work in doing things right, in doing case investigation and contact tracing, and for all of you that are keeping your circle small, staying at home, keeping physical distance, washing your hands, not going out if you are sick, those things all make a difference. Um, and we need to be able to continue to do those things so that we slow down the spread of disease in our community. 
A couple of updates from the state. Yesterday, DHS, the Department of Health Services, announced $10 million for healthcare providers that work with the state's most un, um, underserved populations. That is, again, CARES funding, the federal uh, funding available for COVID-19. So a variety of dollars went out to community health centers, tribal health clinics, uh, free and low cost clinics, um, who are all eligible to um, have some of their expenses covered because of COVID-19 to support those underserved populations. We talked on Wednesday about dollars going out to government entities um, that it was designated as also part of the CARES funding. $3.1 million will be coming to entities within Eau Claire County for townships, villages, cities, and the county in Eau Claire to respond to COVID-19. As we described on Wednesday, those costs of things like PPE, personal protective equipment, isolation and quarantine, emergency operations, testing and contact tracing, and any dollars needed for federal FEMA matching programs um, would be part of what could be used with that money that's coming into Eau Claire County. We also have heard from the state this week that um, while nationally there's been discussion about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is a syndrome seen in children that have been COVID-19 positive, that's been seen across the US. Um, we now have cases in Wisconsin with that syndrome as well. Remember that there's a lot we still don't know about this virus. It is new. Um, this specific coronavirus, while we know a lot about coronaviruses in general, this specific one is new and we are still learning. Um, what we do know is that it's dangerous for older adults and vulnerable populations. The state recommendations still are in place around those populations. Um, and we now know that there are potentially dangerous outcomes for children as well. So new information about this syndrome is important for us to pay attention to. A couple of local updates. Again, our primary tools um, to stop the spread of disease is what we each do individually and who we each expose um, to the disease if we have them. I know that we share the hope that no one we know and love will get seriously ill um, or will die from this disease, but it is happening to friends and neighbors and people across the state that many of us know. Um, we need more than hope. We need to do more than just hope that it doesn't happen here. And I really appreciate everybody that's been making decisions to keep the spread of disease as slow as possible. Thanks, you're making a difference. We did put a new public health order in place as one of our strategies that started this morning um, right after midnight. It's only one of the ways that we're stopping um, the rapid spread of disease, but it is a tool that we've had in the toolbox that's important. Again, our main goal with this order is to make sure that groups um, that are gathering for sustained amounts of time are small and the group sizes have changed a little bit in the new order. Um, 10 and under inside remains, but now 20 and fewer people outside as a uh, public gathering is allowable. In all those gatherings, social distancing, physical distancing remains critically important as our most important way to spread, to stop the spread or to slow the spread of disease. As we continue to track the data that I spoke about earlier and to look at best practices and new things we are learning about this disease, we are continually looking at changes to um, adjust the order moving forward. Um, we also will continue to look at what the strategies are at a state and national level. We anticipate changes in the order moving forward over time related to both the size of gatherings, those public gathering sizes, and related to the, um, the l amount of people that can be in a business at any one time. Right now there are um, specific there is specific language in the order related to capacity as well as distance for businesses. As larger groups gather and there's more possibility of disease spread, we continue to work on building internal capacity as I shared earlier and we'll watch the data to see how effective we are in making sure that that doesn't spread. 
We all have a part to play in this. Um, please stay home when you're sick. That is really one of the most important things you can do. Keep distance when you're out and keep your number of close contacts small. For case investigation and contact tracing, answer your phone. If someone calls and leaves you a message that you are a potential contact to a case, please answer it so you know how and what to, what to do and how to do it. Um, we're counting on you to help us keep that disease spread small as well. Not only do we have the order in place, but we are doing a lot of education, and I think everybody knows that. The website remains available at covid19eauclair.org. Our COVID call center is taking a lot of phone calls from individuals and from businesses, and that number is 715-831-7425. The Chippewa Valley Economic Recovery Task Force, which you've heard about um, it, during these briefings, continues to meet and have very strong presence in the community. They are bringing business sectors together. They are working on recovery, but also importantly working on recovery in a way that slows the spread of disease. So both things are critically important. And we are pleased as a health department and as incident command to be working with the Economic Recovery Task Force on doing this right. Um, and I'm really excited at the energy and enthusiasm there. If you don't know, about the Recovery Task Force and you are a business sector and want to learn more, please go to the website. There are spots at the website to get contact information to talk directly to individuals that are working on specific issues related to your sector, whether whatever that may be in the business community. So now Luke is here to share a little bit about self-care, so I will have him come up and then I'll be back um, to close and to answer questions. Thanks. Thank you, Liska. Uh, thanks for carving out the time to allow us to talk about this important issue of mental health. I also do want to take a moment to just reiterate the importance of continuing the dialogue uh, around racism and uh, really keep our, our neighbors and friends in Minnesota in our hearts and minds as they continue to navigate this challenging time. So the term self-care often comes up when we talk about mental health. And on the surface, it seems like a simple idea, taking care of yourself. If asked what we do for self-care, some of us can struggle to identify what it is we're doing. And sometimes the things we identify wouldn't necessarily fall under the umbrella of self-care, but can be more distractions or indulgences. The way we define self-care is in being deliberate when taking care of yourself through restorative activities. Writer Eleanor Brown says it best when she states that we cannot serve from an empty vessel. Here in the Eau Claire community and in the Chippewa Valley, we work hard to support one another, to help out when we can, and we give pieces of ourselves to those that we can. It's important that we take time to help ourselves as well and put back. One of the hardest parts about self-care is making sure it's a plan and being intentional in putting that plan into use. There are some things that we can implement into a self-care plan and I'm going to give some some quick tips knowing full well this is not an exhaustive list um, but that can be helpful and are really no cost to us. The first thing is taking some time to reflect. Taking some time to reflect on how you're thinking, how you're feeling throughout the day we often go through our days treating our thoughts much like our breathing. We don't think about it and it just automatically happens. One thing that might be helpful is asking yourself or thinking about, am I, am I telling myself I should be doing things throughout the day? Am I spending a lot of time holding myself to an impossible standard through my own internal dialogue? And if that's the case, then perhaps there's an opportunity for us to be kinder to ourselves. Second is taking some time to move. Many of us fall into the trap of saying that we don't necessarily have time to get outside and take that 10 minute walk or spend some time stretching. And this is all despite the fact that we may have watched the entire season of Tiger King in one sitting. Uh, and that may be uh, my own personal experience. 
But even taking a moment to get up, um, if you're in your house with your kids, taking a moment to maybe play a game of hide and seek around the house um, can be a welcome break. We could even call it stealth care. The third is finding time to connect with nature. Here in the Chippewa Valley in Eau Claire, we are resource rich with many places that are beautiful, that are open, that we can visit, all while practicing social and physical distancing. It is so important to connect to the outdoors and to nature, and as the weather continues to improve and summer continues to arrive, take advantage of what we have here in the Eau Claire area. Again, the most important piece of self-care is being intentional and planful. Take time to do the things that rejuvenate you, that make you feel whole. I would encourage all of you to practice one or all three of these this weekend. And if you already have a self-care plan and a repertoire, feel free to add any of these into that same plan. For other helpful tips and resources, please visit the website Resilient Wisconsin. This is a state-run website that brings together the latest mental health and behavioral health self-care tips and trauma-informed practices. Thank you again for your time in, uh, in listening to this important message around self-care. Have a safe and restorative weekend. Thank you for that, Luke. Um, maybe simple reminders, but critically important when we are all working hard and um, may have a fair amount of stress. So thank you for that. I will get outside this weekend, I promise. Um, I am one of those people that have um, really, one of the reasons I love Eau Claire so much is the amazing um, wealth that we have in our community of outside resources that cost absolutely no money. So we're lucky for that. Um, so again, please stay tuned um, to our website and our social media account. Make sure that if you have questions, call our hotline. Um, those resources are available for you to get good information and to stay informed. We want you to have that information um, so you know what to do to keep moving forward. Next week, we will be only live with this media um, cast on Monday and Friday. We're making the decision to do it twice a week. We will be holding a different media event on Wednesdays for um, just question and answer, so that will be available to people. But certainly, we will be updating our website every day and making sure that for those of you that really want that upfront day on information that is current, please go to that site. Again, COVID-19 Eau Claire org. So questions that people have. Yes. Um, you, you touched a little bit on the uh, stuff going on over in Minneapolis right now. And uh, this weekend, if there's any local stuff that's planned for gatherings or anything, I guess, where does that fall within the local order that you guys have? And, um, you know, I know we've touched on this a ton, but maybe just reminders for people who who may want to attend one if there is a local gathering. Um, sure. So the question is related to the potential of local gatherings, similar to what's happening in Minneapolis and St. Paul, as, whether, as well as other communities across the U.S. related to the incidents in um, the Twin Cities with Mr. Floyd. Again, if that happens in our local communities, um, my um, infectious disease message is to keep distance, to wear a cloth face covering um, to make sure you do not go if you are not feeling well to protect those that you are with that you um, know and love and to be respectful of the fact that this is a disease that can be dangerous to people. So please stay home if you're sick, wear a cloth face covering um, if you are out um, and try to maintain some physical distance. Um, the order does not prohibit um, gatherings for this type of um, um, speech reasons, um, and certainly we want people to be safe. Yes? Um, there appear to be two different employees who were tested positive for COVID-19 uh, at two different uh, healthcare facilities in Eau Claire based on statements that we got from those facilities. Um, the county has just reported uh, one investigation into uh, a facility. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? 
So the question is related to on the um, state website, uh, they do update outbreaks on that state website once a week. So once a week, the outbreaks are updated and the information is shared about every county and the outbreaks that are there. We now have three outbreaks in Eau Claire County. Two of them are in um, congregate settings and one of them is a long-term care facility. Long-term care facilities are named on the state website and that is Dove Health um, that is named there. And again, a reminder like we talked about uh, on Wednesday, the um, facilities that are named on that site are not there because there is something specific that we are concerned at a state level about related to their practices. A positive case is not unexpected in the community, nor is it unexpected in any other facility, including a health department employee could you know, be sick just as much as any other employee. Um, so what we have on the website right now and what is available to the public at the moment is the one facility, Dove Health. Health South. Um, those families and individuals have been notified about that um, case. It is an employee and there is no risk of transmission and all the investigation has been done with that facility in really amazingly good cooperation. Again, our facilities in Eau Claire, we are um, fortunate that we have strong relationships already with our long-term care facilities well before COVID-19 and they have been very responsive in working together and with us to make sure that the spread of disease in those facilities is is managed quickly. Yes? Is there an end date to this particular order uh, like it was yesterday mm -hmm. and is there any other Yeah, so the question is related to the order that started um, early this morning. Um, the end date of that order, as the question was asked, is two weeks from today. Um, and we are doing these orders in two week periods to acknowledge that we are looking at data every week and we are not anticipating changes in data any more frequently earlier than a two-week period because of the course of disease so we've committed to looking at data regularly to looking at best practice if things change we will potentially change the order earlier but we really are only moving forward as we see controlled disease spread happening um, our data points you'll see on the website as they go up are really dashed boarded in a red, yellow, green way to signal where we're worried and where we think things are looking okay and the spread of disease is happening but not in an out of control way. So we will continue to do that and share that information very uh, broadly across the community. We want you to know what we're looking at and why we are either comfortable moving forward or um, we, we are challenged with moving forward because of the status of disease in our community. Um, the the primary change, as I said, was related to changing outdoor gatherings to 20 rather than um, less than 10. Um, there were some additional wording changes in the order, but those were the primary changes that were um, of substance. Yes? How are we going to use those? Right, so um, the data dashboard that will be up on the website um, will look substantively different. It will explain kind of what we are looking at related to the order, and then again, as I said, green, yellow, red coloring for each of the data points. So there'll be an ability to look not only at is this red or green, but also what's the actual data behind it. So we want that to be fully available to everybody. We'll also be describing how we, which of those measures we see as critically important. So if, for example, if we are seeing regularly that healthcare can't meet basic standards of care, if that one's red, we are not moving forward with our order. So that's an example of ones that will be looked at in a way that we can't be at yellow or sort of okay. We really, you guys need to count on us to be able to manage this so we don't have an overwhelming system happening. 
other measures we will be watching so um, and they will inform our decision but not be as critical so the most critical measures will be a couple related to disease how quickly are we seeing a change in disease happening so we are getting you know somewhere between two and eight cases a day now if we start getting 20 to 50 cases a day for example and I'm you'll be seeing in our measure exactly how that lays out I'm using that just as an illustration if we see a lot more cases per day where we can't handle them um, making sure that those people are staying home and isolated and their contacts are staying at home and quarantined is critically important to the community and so we'll have to take a pause and slow down then the expectation is that all of you will be working with us so that we manage this disease and we'll see more cases. It's not going to be just based on our case numbers going up because we know that that's going to happen. So that number being read is not the only one we'll look at. We're expecting case numbers to go up. It's just how rapidly and how much can we stay on top of those numbers that we'll really be looking at. So those metrics will be there and we will describe on the website how we are looking at that moving forward and certainly talk about that at each of our media briefings. Yeah. How do you keep in contact, um, especially in rural areas, to the eastern part of the county and communities up there to keep the Amish communities uh, to make sure that there's no guess, hidden or silent outbreaks yeah. of the disease that you may miss, which is easier perhaps to monitor the previous year or yeah, the question is really related to how do we know about disease happening, particularly in some of our more rural parts of our community and maybe more isolated communities within Eau Claire County. The Amish community is an example of communities that exist in our county and um, ones that we would want to make sure that we are watching disease progression there as well. We have very close connections across the county in all of our jurisdictions. We talk weekly to government leaders across Eau Claire County, so that includes all our townships, villages um, in the far eastern side of the state, as well as City of Eau Claire and City of Altoona. So we are in regular contact with those officials and providing updates and information to them as well. We also work with our healthcare partners that have presence in Augusta, um, primarily um, that those that serve serve populations, including our Amish and Mennonite populations, and those people that are in more rural areas. Um, and then in addition to that, we have staff on our team that has historically had very strong relationships with our rural communities and with our outlying areas. So that staff includes people that go to all the schools and work with the school nurses and the school staff, and includes a nurse that specifically works with our Amish population. And, and all of those people are regularly connecting across Eau Claire County. Um, we know that um, in all populations, whether it's urban or rural, that people may be ill and we may not know it. It's a disease that doesn't make everybody very super sick. So there may be people ill. Again, we want to test people with any symptoms, um, no matter where they are in the county. And we want to make sure that people with symptoms um, get those tests. We know if they're COVID positive or not and that they stay home. Yeah, so the question is specifically about one of our metrics, which is in some ways our most important testing metric across the world, which is that we want to test all symptomatic um, people. Um, that is a goal of the state. It is a goal of this community. And one of the challenges is to know what the denominator is. How, are we getting the right percent? Are we getting 100% of all the ill people? Um, so we are working with healthcare right now to find ways to understand how people are being screened in as symptomatic and screened out as symptomatic. Um, our goal is to work with healthcare to understand clearly that all of the people that call with symptoms um, to get tested are being tested and to have a way to measure and count that. So we're, that's one of the measures that 
that's on the website is still to be determined. There isn't a community across the state yet that has exactly figured that out. We've been working with our partners all across the state, including the state health department that's working on testing metrics. We all would like to have an easy way to do this, and um, we're working with our healthcare partners to see if we can model that here. All right, thank you very much everybody for joining us today. We will be back on Monday. I hope you have a restful weekend and do something that is um, related to the self-care tips that we just heard from Luke. Um, and we will talk on Monday, which I believe might be June 1st. So take care.